joining us um, for a little deep dive into Alejandra's piece. Um, she created a uh, site-specific work for um, the current exhibition at Union Hall, which is called Coterminus. Uh, my name is Ari. I am the chief curator at Union Hall. Um, for those of you who don't know Union Hall yet and are just joining us, um, Union Hall is a nonprofit arts exhibition space um, based in Denver, Colorado. And we support diverse emerging artists and try to showcase groundbreaking exhibitions. I love the term groundbreaking, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a big uh, call to live up to. Um, and we also act as a multidisciplinary space for events, performances, um, poetry readings, live music. Um, you know, right now everything is digital, but one day we'll be back live and in person again. Um, our current show, Coterminus, was planned in partnership with CU Boulder's Nest Studio for the Arts um, and curated by Erin Espoli, who is here. Um, she is an assistant professor um, of cinema studies and critical media practices and the co-director of Nest. Um, and um, as many of you know, we're currently closed to in-person visits due to the governor's recent orders. Um, we are really hoping to be able to reopen for timed entry visits to the space very soon. Um, we were doing those before um, when, the, when the exhibition was open through November and um, you can reserve a space um, to see the exhibition on our website. As soon as we're able to reopen, we'll be announcing that on Instagram and through our newsletter. Um, you're welcome to check out our website for more info on the exhibition, Coterminus. Um, and also look out for our upcoming curatorial talk with Erin. Um, we are currently going to be rescheduling that date. So again, look out on Instagram and uh, through our newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website for more information about that. And now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Erin and um, we're going to have a little discussion with Alejandra. I'll be jumping back in at the end to take some questions from you guys. Um, and yeah, enjoy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ari. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight with you all. Before we begin, um, in addition to the support that we've gotten from Union Hall, which has been incredible, I also want to thank generous support given for a Sawyer Seminar on the Comparative Study of Cultures grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as well as partners at CU Boulder, Ari already mentioned, NEST, Nature Environment Science and Technology Studio for the Arts. Also want to thank the Natural Hazards Center and the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies and the Art and Art History Department at CU Boulder. So the Mellon Sawyer Seminar this, this year that we have is called Deep Horizons, Making Visible an Unseen Spectrum of Ecological Casualties and Prospects. And in it, what we're aiming to do is cross a lot of different disciplines gather different perspectives and try and investigate really these intersectional questions concerning how our planet is changing and how it affects specific peoples, communities, different wildlife species and ecosystems in highly varied and inequitable ways. So this project calls for, for empathy, attunement, and an outlook that, that encompasses a diversity of individuals and communities and collaborative entities that are committed to climate justice and more ethically durable futures. And what we'll be talking about tonight with Alejandra covers all of that. Um, but before we dive into that, I wanted to also acknowledge that there are 48 tribal nations historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. And it's critical not only to acknowledge, but, but also to actively address the particular harms that settler colonialism and institutions who benefit from colonialism, including CU Boulder, perpetuate on indigenous lands and peoples, especially in the context of this particular Mellon Sawyer seminar. Um, so in thinking about uh, Coterminus as an exhibition, I was really wanting to think about the ways we attempt to delineate time and space and how often we fail at those attempts. We are fully enmeshed. Uh, we are living beings and we are constantly amid different continuums. And so therefore, as we look to our environmental futures, I think we have to think about how shared they are and um, what it means to constantly be realigning and finding different vantages as we look more closely at what's being lost around us, what might be inequitable and, and where we can make some lasting improvements. 
So as Ari mentioned, I'll be talking in more depth about Coterminus um, in the form of a digital gallery tour, as well as uh, some answering questions in person at a later date. But tonight I wanna focus on the artists who are in the exhibition. And if you've been in person to Union Hall, you'll know that Union Hall looks out on Union Station on track number eight. And just so there are eight artists in this show, Coterminus, Diane Burko, Tanya Candiani, Raven Chacon, Amy Felder, Camila Friedman Gerlitz, Erica Osborne, Herbert Fostel, and the artist we have with us tonight, Alejandra Abad. So we commissioned to her to make a work specifically for this show. Let me introduce her a little bit. She was born in Venezuela and has since lived and studied and made work in Florida, in Chicago, and she's currently based in Colorado where she's pursuing an MFA in interdisciplinary media arts practices at CU Boulder, but she'll soon be a graduate. Um, she's an interdisciplinary artist and she explores landscapes through abstraction and light as we'll hear a little bit more about tonight. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to invite her to make work for the show, um, because she's interested in how we can break down barriers um, in thinking about landscape and, um, and also even beyond that, thinking about breaking down barriers between the artist and the audience. Um, and she's also interested in some of the, the themes of, of the Mellon Seminar and what's inherent to Nest Studio for the Arts, um, thinking about animacy, equity, land fragmentation. Um, I was also drawn to the, to the way in which she, she employs both analog and digital processes, including painting, animation, sculpture, um, to make really immersive environments. So before we hear specifically about this piece, Biome versus Borders, Alejandra, I was wondering if you might describe your path or your evolution as you see it in, in simply becoming an artist. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful intro and the time with you uh, here. Um, my path. My path began as a child in Venezuela and I saw so many changes. Um, growing up with my family, growing up with my brother, who is deaf, definitely um, the way we communicated with each other was uh, drawing and playing games that were very visual. And so I think like from an early age, I saw inequity and that really, really um, impacted me. And I also saw the collapse of the economy in Venezuela. And I also saw, <laughs> then I was brought here and I also saw so many different um, social issues with immigrants and as you know it, as of now. Um, and one of the things that kept me going was like the visual language that I, uh, that I had with my, my sister too. And so we kind of always like played with like video cameras or, or sound or anything that was available to us. And I kind of was just really immersed with that. And I was immersed with the idea of changing what's in front of me, creating a sense of wonder. Um, and that's kind of why I love playing with light and animation. <laughs> so then I went to, um, first I went to, an architecture school um, at FAU. Uh, they had an architecture program. And then I took a drawing class um, with um, my dear mentor, Lane Bach, that has passed away. And she said, you have to apply to the Art Institute of, Ch of Chicago, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. You'll totally get in. I was like, OK. <laughs> so I did. And so that also um, transformed me. And it was almost like a metamorphosis too, because it was such a change from the familiar that I had developed in Florida. And it was, again, another like complete change. And there I really uh, was introduced to technology, to new media, to video, um, video art, film, animation. And yeah, I think that paved the way, my instructors, uh, my family. Um, and now, <laughs> I, when I, when I moved back to Florida, I started working a lot with the community and I feel like that is so important to give back and to um, create a pedagogy of care 
And I think that's been my aim here at CU Boulder is to find ways to create empathy and uh, kind of destroy that, that barrier that doesn't allow people to also play or discover or feel empathy. Um, and so that's where, I, where, I'm, where I'm at. I'm trying to figure out like, how do I do that? <laughs> Oh, I love that phrase, the pedagogy of care, because I do think we we need to learn that. And so often I find art is a is a wonderful tool and a, a tool that can teach us so many things. Um, but but it's it's slightly more um, generous in its in its way of offering paths for people to learn, not kind of in the in the technical sense of the pedagogical, which I often associate with something truly didactic. But um, yeah, that's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful way of thinking about it. Well, I, you know, again, one of the things that you've, you've returned to in, in your works is, is landscape. And so I was curious if there, if there were things uh, in the history of landscape painting or your relationship with landscape or place that continues to be kind of part of how, how you're um, mining the world around you and, and then responding. Absolutely. I think my um, my relationship to place and geography and the history of the land is very, very tight to um, traveling from Venezuela, where it's like a valley with mountains. And like if you drive away from the city, it's like it opens up an ocean. So visually, um, so many changes um, seeing the valley, the mountains, like diversity, like the flora, the fauna, as an early child, um, really, really stuck with me. And I also had an uncle who, <laughs> um, he's funny, he invited the entire family to, um, to his wedding one day. And we were really lucky. And we saw, I got to see New York for the first time. And it was just, I think it was a few days. And I saw a different landscape. I saw the subway, I saw <laughs> the graffiti area because it, it was a different, it was a different New York and it was beautiful to me. It was full of drawings and gestures. And then I came back to Venezuela to the everyday, right? So it was like such different cultures and such, such a different contrast. And there was like, a really unique opportunity that I think like made my brain think, wow, like you really can tell a story by using visual language. And um, and so then <laughs> Florida is completely different too. There's no mountains. <laughs> so here starts the, the exploration for fragmentation and identity and storytelling and non-linear uh, ways of telling stories. So abstracting, in creating rhythm. And I've always been really interested in, in that idea of how different different places look and how they're attached to equity and, and, and how they're attached to real people and why is it that there's so many um, issues depending on zip code, for example. <laughs> so, and that's always been in my mind. Uh, you know, if you apply for a job or if you apply for a school, like they look at your zip code and all of these things are always like, the land is the land, like where are the borders, right? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think that, um, you know, we're seeing a little bit of your work right now behind you, uh, but let's but let's dive into that into that work because exactly as you mentioned, zip code that played a role in how you started to think about this piece, um, and certainly we I think as we were, you know, co collaborating in our explorations around this, we were also influenced by the election, which did interestingly break down so much along um, urban rural divides. So I, I'm, I'm so curious about some of the ways those that that's influenced this project too. But maybe you could walk us through, I certainly had such an, a wonderful experience um, as we as we thought about this commission and it started just so the, the people kind of watching can know, it started with an idea about um, a scientific study that was looking at specific areas, um, urban and rural areas that were impacted in 
in varied ways uh, with environmental pollution. So both in California and then this study also was looking at North Carolina. Uh, and, uh, and so we were, we were thinking about these maps and the way in which these maps were so stark because so many things lined up, um, income levels, uh, the higher the income level, the better the air quality or the less pollution, et cetera. And so then that started to infuse this project. Um, and, and we came even closer down to Union Hall and started looking at Globeville um, and the Superfund sites that are, that are so close to where this, where this exhibition is. So maybe you could now take us into the, to your process of, of creating this piece. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, if, if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, this process uh, came about a lot of conversations and I am really lucky to have been able to conversate with you. Um, let's see, here is my screen and I will enter. All right, can everybody see this? That looks great. Okay, great. Um, so if you've been to the exhibition, like was said before, um, it's, in, it's in the train um, station. So Union Hall is connected to the train tracks. And so there's a lot of uh, lines and borders and elements that um, surround the area. And so we were really thinking about what's connected um, to Union Hall. And so by looking at some of the maps that I'm going to show you, uh, we started seeing um, through conversation, we, I think we were having a Zoom conversation that day, and we were fascinated, especially by the organic shape that the uh, tra train tracks have um, and how there's all this movement. And I, at first I imagined this piece as a moving piece, um, as an animation, because I kind of saw like these uh, train tracks as like veins and pumping. Um, but I also wanted to do a little bit more of um, dissecting. So we started um, looking at other kinds of maps. Um, we saw the line border that was created for Globeville. And so this is kind of the shape of Globeville right here, um, which was also incorporated to the sculpture. Um, and then we got to the the really, really, um, how would I say, um, hazardous <laughs> part of the project where um, a lot of these areas have been um, very uh, active in hazardous material. There were smelting um, factories and industries that kind of polluted the waterways, the, the, the soil, and you can imagine. And all of these areas are working class areas where immigrants have lived and still uh, live through this day. Um, and I was, I was really fascinated by also like the way these super fun sites were placed and it still kind of created this like um, embody uh, so, like, I don't want to say circular, but it, it, it was contained in Globeville and the areas around it, um, the north side of Denver. And I was wondering, wow, like, what is, what are these areas um, look like now? Because many of these um, areas, the EPA erased, right? Um, now they're in reused. But what does that even mean? Um, when there's all this history, right? And so we were looking at the health equity and we were looking at the heat maps. And of course, with impervious surfaces in North Denver, a lot of these elements like parking lots, um, railways, roofs, roads, driveways, all of these create and trap a lot of heat. Um, and it's a lot of in like, commerce areas and industry that is. Um, and so when you look at the heat map, you can see here's like Globeville and Union Station is right here. So my whole approach to this is how we're, how these borders are there, but we're very um, 
connected, like one organism. And so that's where all these like elements started um, happening. And this is kind of like where I started making choices of what elements I was going to show in the map. Um, and a lot of the heat also happens wherever there's like uh, traffic uh, by cars. And so it also affects the quality of, of, um, of the air too. So it has all these elements. So yeah, there are other places in the world that are really polluted, but Globeville in particularly has a long history and has all these elements that kind of um, suggest that um, a lot of the people um, have health issues. And so that's a really big problem. Um, that doesn't go away by just <laughs> erasing it from the EPA. Um, so thinking about that, I decided that I was going to collect material. Um, and so I collected flora and recycled paper, um, and I combined it with other kinds of paper. And I started this process. Um, here's an example of like the pulp with like flora. Um, and I will show you a little bit of like what these places look like and what like the material starts looking like after um, I put it together. Um, this picture is in Commerce City and the Woodbury Chemical Company is not there anymore, but I use the reference just to give you an idea of like what used to be there. Um, and this is the Sarco Inc. Glove plant. This is where it would have been. Um, all this area over here from 51st to 55th. And then it extends on Washington all the way to like the highway. Um, obviously it's not a, a Sarco anymore, but it used to be there. And so now it's in reuse. So I, I started collecting a lot of the materials um, from the areas uh, nearby. And a lot of the material like uh, started leashing like a lot of rust rust and different kind of colors and it was very poetic because it really does like represent this industrial hard chemical and pollution um, and this one was a collection of wildflowers at the Vasquez Boulevard and 70 I-70 and there's like a little park. There's actually various little parks in the middle of all these like in the industrial areas, which I found really interesting. Um, also, this one was really interesting to me. This house was kind of being taken over <laughs> by, by nature. And I just thought it was so fascinating that uh, this, this it's like really poetic. It's like nature and like, human <laughs> although we're all one, like one organism right like we're all nature but it just you know fauna over like these man-made uh, materials um and this is a little close-up of the material and this is one it's flat um but i allowed all of these materials to air dry naturally and i didn't um I didn't give it a shape. I just kind of allowed it to dry and take its own shape. Some pieces started breaking and I, I was okay with it. I was like, okay, you, you broke. <laughs> so, um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the elements came together. Um, so, so many pieces, it's like a big puzzle. It took forever to put together. Um, and the way that I did it was through mapping. So it, it's, it was very meta. <laughs> it's like, I'm making a map by using a map <laughs> um, and putting the ratio and the proportions and, and repeating and doing this like hand labor. Um, planning and connecting. And every time I saw this, I just saw it moving. Um, even though it's like a still map, I, I see the movement. And I think, um, as I will show you later, these pieces uh, hang from the ceiling and the bigger pieces, the organic pieces, sometimes catch the air from the gallery and they start moving. So I feel like 
it's alive in, in a way. Um, it has this like life. <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to show you some pictures of some of these places. And, and you can see the city um, skyline here. But this is very much like what it looks like now. Um, this used to be an active site. Um, now it's in reuse. Um, it's very, very industrial, a lot of concrete. And so now you can start getting the picture why the heat map would be so high and red because it's, there's a lot of concrete, there's not a lot of green uh, metal. Uh, and here's another picture of the edge of uh, Washington. Here's where the highway is. Um, this is a close up of kind of like the the materials that you can see. You see a lot of rust and metal and bags and, and petroleum based products. Um, but you also see um, the the influence of like cultures like moving in like there's um, a Mexican restaurant here. There's um, Guzman's tires and I'm sure is maybe someone that is Latinx or, or whatnot. And <laughs> everything in the pictures really show this um, rust and, and metal, like, like things just like kind of leach from the material into like the, the bricks. Um, I also found out that this is where um, they recycle copper and aluminum, aluminum and brass. Um, and it was really, really amazing to see this big claw come in and like grab like all these materials and recycle it. Um, that was really interesting. Um, then moving away from here, I wanted to see the Globeville Land Park, which I thought was really interesting because when you see the pictures from the EPA in their PDF where they're proposing this um, land park, it's really, really green. <laughs> like full of trees. But when you get here, um, it's not the case. Um, the water is very, very contaminated and polluted. You could tell by the growing algae and like the shore of it. Um, this, this is the Pepsi-Cola factory. Um, and it just gives you a very, very uh, different uh, description of what you read and what you experience on foot um, and here's a beautiful logo. <laughs> and then I moved also into the Vasquez Boulevard and the I-70 area. And there was always the presence of the train tracks, which I think was like really connecting to the work and really going back to Union Station. Had, like all these ways are connected to, to the site. Um, and, you know, there's a certain beauty about these big um, industrial like pieces like next to like a like a sunset. Um, and there's things that are happening uh, that are like really, really interesting. Like I found this picture of a reward for like a missing uh, cross border and Mexican ID card that somebody lost which also goes back to like this like history of this area being um, since the 1800s, like uh, immigrant area. Um, and also I started seeing um, that a lot of the, the flora, a lot of the, the bushes, a lot of the leaves had like also the same type of rust, like this kind of browning, um, which I thought was really interesting. And a lot of markings which really like was like really fascinating. Like I just saw so much play in the area. Um, this one area is the, what used to be the Woodbury chemical um, factory. And this is the Commerce City area. And all of these places are really, really close to each other, by the way. Um, and just like traveling through here this area was like, do not enter, <laughs> which is like, hey, like, this is my, my turf. <laughs>
So it was just really interesting going back to this idea of like human and like what like nature does naturally. And then I was wondering, like, I have no idea why this water is like, if it's water, because <laughs> I think it's very rusty looking. I don't know what <laughs> it's going on there, but I took a picture because I thought it was um, really fascinating. Um, and these are all their elements. Um, oh, I jumped. And then I also, um, the last stop was um, Sand Creek Industrial Area. And I took some pictures um, over the highway areas where there's supposed to be like this nice lake area, but it's not the case. It's very, very much polluted. And, but the Martin Luther King area is like way nicer than that area. But I still, I still extracted some, some of the plants from different parts of um, this area. Um, and yeah, and <laughs> I think I jumped into the last. Yeah, before time. we before we um, go to that slide, maybe yeah, if we could land there for a minute. Um, you know, I'm so I, I, so one point about these images for the audience is that um, is that these are being shown in a digital format. Uh, alongside the more sculptural light based um, piece that you have hanging that that really does draw out the the maps um, these all these different through lines of the waterways the railways the the highways um, uh, in contrast to the kind of more organic paper-based materials that you have behind it um, and and what I love about the the sculpture is that it's it, it's it's so lightweight. I mean, and you can tell, as you said, because it moves with the slightest kind of breath. It, it kind of shivers and shimmers and sh you know shimmies around um, as people move past it. And so you feel the lightness of it. I mean, it really does feel like it it could just lift off and and, and fly away. Um, in contrast to, to these heavy metals that are contaminating all aspects of, of um, some of these sites that are that are so close by, and you've chosen to represent those in with digital materiality and the fact that you are using a device um, that really highlights, oh yes, these are the materials that we need for our digital technological world. Um, so the fact that you chose to have that there, I think is, is quite poignant. Um, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit more just about the final, the final sculptural component of um, of the, the, the quote unquote map um, and, and just your, some of your decisions. I mean, you use so many different materials. You talked about the, um, about the paper that you made from the sites, but also there's, there's wood that you laser cut. Um, could you go into maybe a little bit more detailed about um, also you, just your choice of, of how to decide what was positive and negative space and how light itself also becomes this character in the performative aspect of the sculpture? Oh, absolutely. Um, thank you for noticing that. Yeah, I think that we are in this mess together, <laughs> like the, the technology and the modernism and the promise of colonially. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so we, but then we have these materials that are so, so, so light. And so the way I um, decided to do this is that I, I kind of imagine these layered and 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 that one piece wouldn't be more powerful than the other does that make sense like one piece complemented the other um and i also thought um that the lighting was like super super important because it created this element of like shadow and the play of movement and and dimension and so with the with the organic pieces, I decided to put them in the back. And the reason I did that was because if I were to do that, um, they could easily uh, rotate and not be constrained by the roads, the maps, um, kind of like pointing at freedom, like and giving them agency as like they can take over this structure. <laughs> and they're like at this um, coexistence with each other. And so the negative and the positive became like a conversation between the two um, elements. And 
you have the very planned uh, strict grid, but then you have to build around nature, right? You have to like build around the river. You have to build <laughs> around like different elevation. And so there's still a conversation with, with nature because all of these elements are drawings that uh, pertain to the land and the landscape. Um, and so that part, um, I think, started coming together after cutting it um, up and having all the pieces away from each other and then kind of layering them and comparing them to each other. Um, there are some things that I thought would work. I had another layer, which was... Um, laser cut waterways into this um, mylar material but it was just not it was just not working with like the lightness of the paper and so I scrapped it and so there were some things that the sculpture wanted to do also um, and I couldn't fight it <laughs> like, it was just not um, oh, wonderful <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh fantastic well um I wanted to, I want to make sure we leave room and space for people um, in case there are any questions from the audience. So I want people to know that, um, that they can put questions in the chat and we'll turn to those in just a second. Um, but yeah, overall, I just, I'm so amazed by how you've brought all of these different elements together in such a thoughtful um really, again, going back to that idea of caring, I mean, caring for place, caring for a variety of different species beyond the human, the botanical, um, but the lack and absence of, of other non-human animals, um, and bringing all of that in, in, into this very specific place that, that does connect to the, to the railway station back to, back to where we are located. So I do hope people can come in in person if they haven't already, because it does have completely different spatial sense. And again, the lighting has all these, these magical qualities that really do actually turn out to be more animated than not. Um, there is a kind of live animation effect that's happening happening with this piece that that's quite magical. So so thank you so much, Alejandra, for, for, for making this um, and and really enlivening the space uh, and and the intellectual conversations that we're that we're having around around these environmental futures. Um, I wonder if before we take questions uh, from anyone who might have them, if you could just let us know, yeah, about, I saw that last slide of yours, if you have oh, any, yeah. any upcoming work you can tell us about that we can keep an eye out for as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am currently collaborating with Roman and Aya, and we are collecting people's thoughts and wishes and hopes for the new year. So if you have a wish, or you have a thought, you can go to this website, um, www.unils.club, <laughs> and you can, in the form, you can write in any language that you that you speak, you can write um, your wish. And um, in January, we're going to have a motorcade, and we're going to display um, the flags. And what we're doing is we're, we will distribute um, flag uh, kits to different communities and we will then collect them and bring them into the motorcade and we have it's a big collaboration between different parts um, inside the Santa Fe Art District there's Museo de las Americas there is Red Line for checking in and we have the Lighthouse Riders who we will be making workshops with. And we're also gonna have a virtual world. So it's gonna be really fun. Um, and then <laughs> coming up <laughs> in 2021, um, I will be a feature artist at the Denver Art Museum. Um, and I'm really excited about that. And we're also uh, thinking about care, we're thinking about empathy, borders, um, and how these connect and how we have boundaries and what does that, like, how do we uh, speak on that level? Um, and we're also in 2021 in Florida, in the Pompano uh, Beach Cultural Center, I will have um, Memoria Mitos. It's going to be uh, like all animation immersive environment. Um, so yeah, check it out. 
<laughs> if you can. Um, yeah. Any oh, questions? <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Um, and I'll, I'll give a shameless plug as well for, um, for the Environmental Futures. If you go to the Environmental Futures um, website at CU Boulder, we have also some really exciting things coming up. Uh, even as soon as Tuesday, we have Robin Wall Kimmer, an ethnobotanist who will be speaking about, about her work and she'll be in conversation with um, uh, a, a CU associate professor, Clint Carroll in ethnic studies, talking about, um, talking about their work. Uh, and then in the spring, we have, we have numerous, numerous things as well. So please uh, keep following Union Hall and keep following um, Environmental Futures. And of course, we will keep following you, Alejandra. Uh, and <laughs> uh, excited to see, to see some of these works that, that are coming up. So if, yeah, if anybody has any questions, they can put them in the chat and those will make their way to us. Um, and I see that, um, Ari is coming back on and um, might be able to field some of those questions for us. We'll just field some of those questions. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to read a couple of questions from here. Thank you, Alejandra. That was a beautiful walkthrough of the piece, and I, I loved seeing the photos. I feel like that um, element of it, especially being able to see. Um, it's it's really wonderful to see like your whole process of creating the paper and yeah I just enjoyed all of that so much um, okay reading from the chat um, we have someone who asked um, in regards to the places that are no longer there um, within Globeville I'm assuming she's talking about the super fun sites and some of those um, places where all of that um, industrial activity was going on uh, why are they no longer there? Was it for economic reasons? Um, and also, she wants to thank you uh, for bringing a sense of wonder to, to your work. Oh, thank you. Um, the reason they're not there is because um, they had, I think they had, they had to close. For example, the in 1993, I'm going to estimate it was 1993, um, they had to make this big effort to remove the oil to change, uh, to to dig dig in the waterways, and that is very costly. So yeah, I don't think I don't think a company. Uh, my guess is like I think like a company that did so much damage would stay continuing that damage. So my guess is that yeah, like the EPA intervened so that we would have like a healthier uh, city and uh, they had to, because I think by law, we have to protect humans, <laughs> our human rights. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, um, but I do think that that doesn't mean that economically, like the, the area is dead. Actually, they're tr there is full of commerce. And as you saw, there was like a restaurant and, it's still very, um, it's, I still think it's very industrial, to be honest, um, mm -hmm. and should be more regulated. <laughs> I think also there's a lot of shipping um, that goes on in that area now too, like the big Amazon facility for Denver is now there. And yeah. um, I've noticed, um, I used to live sort of close to there, um, and I've noticed that it's a lot of, um, activity that you know still uses some of those same pathways but just in completely dif different ways than um the previous industrial sort of spaces that were there yeah and i think the industry has also changed like we can't mm -hmm. smelt things anymore that way right. <laughs> um another question do you feel the piece said everything you wanted to say or how slash what else would you have liked to include in the installation oh that's such a good question um thank you Yes, I kind of think that I was really obsessed with the idea of creating an animation that was projected onto the map that kind of created the movement of the ways of the railroads and the and the ways. And I think that's still in my head, but I don't think that that I would change it as of now, because what ended up happening is something really poetic is that I used um, um, cellophane paper that was red 
to put it on the light bulb, not directly on the light bulb, but like with a distance, with a safe distance. Mm -hmm. So then it projected the zone, like the heat map almost oh. <laughs> to the area. And behind the, the lines, there's like these movements are happening with the light and, and the organic paper. And I don't think, yeah, I, thinking back, I, I don't think it needs the animation. But I, I was really set on that. <laughs> I have a question for Erin also, um, just to kind of maybe give folks a little bit of a preview of what's to come in your curatorial talk. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, how you chose Alejandra for the exhibition and how you see her work as fitting into sort of the larger themes that you were hoping to address with Coterminus? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it, I hope it's clear from her talk tonight that um, she's kind of made for this and mm -hmm. it was really ideal. Uh, but yeah, Alejandra and I met last summer, a summer ago, when she was a Nest Fellow uh, for a program that we had called Marble Marble, which funded one, um, one MFA student or one graduate student from CU Boulder to go to this really special, unusual summer gathering of marble sculptors. So Alejandra has all of these amazing skills and talents as as a marble sculptor, as a <laughs> painter and um, woodcutter and paper maker and video artist. She and I were just in a, a show together, actually both um, having made films. So that was one of the things that really interested me. But most of all, I, I think it was the fact that Alejandra has this kind of great capacity for research uh, and, and incorporating really in sensitive fashion ideas. And that was what I wanted to do was work with someone who would really um, respond to this idea of what coterminous is. And so at the beginning of our conversations, which started many, many months ago, uh, we just really started with that with a, a statement I had come up with about what it what it is to think about things being so enmeshed and intersectional. Um, and then we really were able to kind of develop from there, but it, it's this leap of, of, of faith as a curator to say, oh, could you make something? And I hope that it will tie everything else together in the whole show. And, <laughs> and it did. So uh, I feel, yeah, really, really fortunate that we, that we got to work together. Absolutely. I feel like it's such a signature piece of the exhibition. Um, you know, it's right there when you walk into the gallery. And I think it's just a strong connection to um, the space that the exhibition takes place in. And, and of course, Alejandra brings, you know, the flavor and the inspiration of all these other projects that you that you spoke about um, to, you know, tackling something that is just a little bit north of Denver. And I think that's such a beautiful aspect of the piece. A um, couple more questions from the chat. Um, millennial gentrification movements have reversed the decline narrative around cities that prevailed in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Do you think this is a good thing and do you think it will continue? So I hear you say millennial? <laughs> yeah, that's what it says in the, um, but I think, I think it means um, the gentrification that sort of oh. started to boom around the millennium. Um, I see, wait, okay. Yeah, so like the past 20 years or so. Yeah, I, so I told everybody earlier that um, I had lived in Florida. So I'm definitely very familiar with gentrification. I've seen little Haiti um, and how like a lot of like galleries move in yeah. and now they're really thinking about taking it out, like out and, and building all these like hotel industries when that's a very national like that's a national treasure mm -hmm. it's a beautiful like city that has like so many cultural centers so I think yeah gentrification is does affect right because when we as creators don't acknowledge that I think we are also hurting the people that are from those neighborhoods especially like you saw like that that area in North Denver is very like working class and yeah I'm so I think that conversation is is very similar to what's happening with like nature you still go on that road to take the highway and then you take that highway and then back home and then you still put that gas into the 
the, mm-hmm. <laughs> the car. And so are we complicit? I think we are. Um, but I also think like, if you don't go to work, then you don't get paid or also. So it's like a very complex answer. And, but I do definitely think gentrification is bad and it does affect every, every aspect of, of art making. And I think that's why when we make art, we really have to like be conscious about what it means to make this art and like to point out these issues. I think it's really, really great. And we should have more conversations about that and how to coexist in a way that prices don't skyrocket and we don't kick people out of their homes. <laughs> I've actually heard, I read something recently, like the term gentrification sort of like rebranded as art districtification <laughs> because there is sort of this practice that happens when, you know, there's certain um, spaces within a city that have fallen into disrepair. Maybe the uh, industry that was previously there left, or maybe um, it's just poor working class communities that are living there, which is seen as undesirable by developers within the city. And so, um, so often we see those areas first converted and taken over by artists. And yeah. I think as members of the arts community, we all, you know, need to kind of practice more responsibility around um, how and where we exist within the spaces that we occupy. And um, it's something that like in LA, there's a lot of discussions around places like Boyle Heights. Um, and in Denver too, like you mentioned, I think Rhino is a really good example of that as well. What, you know, we've seen a lot of the DIY spaces and a lot of the, I mean, all kinds of things just pushed out of that area. Um, I think responsible development is something that a lot of people yeah. you know, are thinking about these days. And I think as members of the arts community, we sometimes are the first people to enter those spaces. So yeah, just being like really mindful about um, what what we are taking away when we are injecting our own perspective into those spaces. I personally think about that a lot as a white person in any place that I am. Um, it's just kind of trying to be you know more responsible and more mindful about how we're taking up space and, and how and how we're contributing as well um, yeah, I agree. there's one more question here that i think is a really good last one to wrap up um, and it kind of relates um, to the previous one here too but um, what would you like the viewer to take away when they see your installation i want them to think about um how we're all connected um that was that was like my heart like in this piece, my heart in this piece was thinking about it as like a organism. It was like when you really think about, I was I was talking to both of you about when we think about the air, when we think about the water, when we think about the land, it all is connected, it all travels, like it doesn't stay in one place, it's ever changing. So my hope is that that message is carried out because we're so um, and 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 to kind of piggyback on the other answer, as an artist, I don't want to just show something that's like catchy and beautiful. I also want to really put out a message that kind of follows my ethics and my ethics say that hey, even though I'm exhibiting here in this beautiful gallery space, this is connected to a huge problem that we really need to tackle. <laughs> Um, that borders are not, you know, all that real, like everything's connected. It does affect people, so. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think that's a, I think that's a great place to leave it. I mean, I think that is sort of like the connecting thread throughout Coterminus as well, is just that like all of these factors are so inextricable the way that they affect various different communities around the planet, the way that they affect wildlife and, um, and natural resources. And um, I just really appreciate you both taking the time tonight to lay some of this out for us. And it was so great to dive deeper into your piece and, and learn more about your inspiration and your process. And um, yeah, thank you guys both for being here. I, I so appreciate it. Thank you both too. I'm, I'm so lucky. And again, thank you everybody that tuned in. Yeah, thank you everyone who's here. Thank you for joining us. We really thank you, mommy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shout out to mom. mom. <laughs> My sister. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, thank you everyone again. And we hope you'll stay tuned for more updates on Union Hall. Um, and go to our website to check out our newsletter, to check out more about, about Crow Terminus. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to reopen for some timed appointments here soon. So those of you who have not had an opportunity um, to see the exhibition will be able to come in and, and see the exhibition soon.
Um, <laughs> special appearance from my dog, Leo. <laughs> Thank you, Ari. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.